I was actually in Holland when I got the call and, I, and Ghostface was with me. And so I was like, yo, Ghost, what's up? You like Miley Cyrus? He's like, I love her. You're watching Enemies in Conversation series and today we're joined by the legendary RZA. Hello. Peace. How are you doing today? Very good. Um, so you've just directed Cutthroat City, which is out now. How did the script for the film end up in your hands? Wow. Uh, the writer, uh, Paul Kashuri, he had, um, you know, he was looking for directors in Hollywood. And I think that the agents brought it to me. Um, I read it. I love the story. I love what it was about. I had a meeting with him and, um, you know, he, he pointed out, you're not from New Orleans and you mm -hmm. don't know, you didn't live through Hurricane Katrina, but the story of four young men who have aspirations and their aspirations turn into desperations and lack of opportunity. I understand mm -hmm. that story. I live that story. And I explained that to him that that's the meat of what I would love to tell. I would love to tell how, you know, that situation that these four young men are in because I've been in that situation. And he mm -hmm. felt my pitch. He felt that I was uh, the guy to tell the story and he put it in my hands and we went on and developed it with the producers and bong bong, here we are. As director, how much say did you get in the casting of the film? Was there anyone you knew you definitely wanted involved? I mean, the director has uh, the vision of, of all films. So he gets the, you know, he has that power of casting. But... It's a collaborative effort as well. So the producers also come in and they have ideas and, and this collaboration will lead to, to you getting the best cast you can. Mm -hmm. And for me, uh, the cast changed over about three or four times before I finally landed with the cast that I had. Okay. How did the legendary Wesley Snipes get involved? Was he always first choice for the part of Blink's dad? No, actually, no. Wesley was a lucky, lucky, lucky catch for me. Uh -huh. um, the part wasn't fulfilled yet. Mm -hmm. And um, we didn't know, like, should we cast it with a regular actor, you know, normal actor, you know, a day player? Yeah. Or should we get some strength behind it? And Wesley had became a valuable. And, and uh, the producers, uh, one of the producers told me that Wesley was a valuable and, you know, he'll hop on the phone with you. So meanwhile, me and Wesley are Kung Fu brothers, right? We have the same Sifu, Sifu Shin Yang Ming. Uh, okay. And we haven't seen each other in a while. So when we got on the phone, it was just magic. And and I told him, you know, this this character is is a special character in the film. And I would love for him to come in, come in, play, play with me. And he, he said, you know what? Mm -hmm. I think I got something for the character. And he came in with some ideas. And uh, wow, it was really a blessing to have him join this, join this cast. And someone else who's great in the film is Moore, who, as well as playing Raekwon in American Saga, is also the star of the animated Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse film. Are you a fan of that film? Did you see it? It had some great reviews. Oh, of reviews. course. Of course. Of course. That's a great yeah. film. I watched it three <laughs> times already. <laughs> but, what do you um, love about that film? So, yeah, this film is great. I mean, it starts off with the with the, the, the music, the animation, the story, the sea of the sea, uh, ultimate universe where Peter Parker it's just a 40-year-old dad with a belly. <laughs> the, the kind of dad I'm trying not to be. <laughs> and then he has to build himself back up. No, it was a Marvel. Listen, Marvel. Hey, what could we say? Marvel. I'm a, I'm a comic book geek. And to see all these stories mm -hmm. come on the big screen for me is, is super joy. But and Shamik is a unique talent. You know, I watched him in his film Dope. It's when I first kind of discovered his talent. Mm -hmm. And then he was on a TV series called The Get Down. And it was there that I realized that this kid really has something special. And when I brought him in to, uh, to be Blink, um, he was just so soft-spoken, but so much like a piece of clay. Mm -hmm. And he allowed himself to be molded, you know? And I think he delivered a great job for me in this film. Yeah. Did you ever consider casting yourself in the film? You're an actor too, why are you not in it? No, no, I think for me, my first film I ever did was called The Man with the Iron Fist, mm -hmm. where I directed it and acted in it. And uh, while that was a great achievement for me, um, I realized in order to do that, you got to have a lot of time. And film is a very expensive medium where time is very expensive, right? And so I strive to make sure that I gave all my talent around me all my energy instead of 
taking myself and putting myself in the middle mm-hmm. of uh, of everything. You know, I know a lot of directors do that, and I, put, I, I I may do it in the future, but for my last two films, I actually made it my business not to get in. Even though the studio asked, the studio did ask me to get in my last film, mm. and I was like, no, I'm not getting in the makeup chair. I need the makeup department never to see me other than as their director. I don't need being there in the morning with the makeup conversations. <laughs> and uh, another big name who is involved the music and the score was done by Danny Harrison, son of George Harrison from the Beatles. How long have you known him and why was he perfect for that job? Wow. So me and Donnie became friends. Uh, I feel like, I don't know, definitely 10 years ago, we, we had a common friend in California and they introduced us and, uh, um, and you know, you know, is at my wedding. We became really good okay. brothers. Yeah. But I've been watching him do music scores in Hollywood, and he did a great documentary for HBO. And I've been watching him do what he did, what he does. And the opportunity came that he was available to potentially score my film. And I was like, mm-hmm. wow. First of all, I love the guy. Second of all, I love his creativity. Third of all, I think he has some of the most coolest, unique instruments. He's just, he just has all these crazy sounds. He's a smart smart guy and you can imagine the things that he got from his from his pops or whatever but Danny's such a great musician so I invited him over to watch an early screening of the film and and he like he enjoyed it and he said he would love to score it and bong bong he came on board and you know he, he said he said something that was really interesting he's like I want to try to find the sound of the hurricane I was like whoa okay okay when he said that I told the producers we gotta hire this guy he's he's <laughs> he's going in deep and the film is a, it's a heist movie at its core. What to you is the ultimate heist movie? A casino, Ocean's Eleven. What's your personal favorite? Wow, that's a good one. Uh, wow, well, you, you named two of the top ones. Ocean Eleven <laughs> is such a masterpiece. Casino, yeah. um, you know, mix of heist and mafia. And the one I think that really drove all of our gentlemen crazy was Heat. Michael Mann's Heat. That mm-hmm. one really uh, had everybody, you know, I just remember watching it in the movies theater and just being like, this is crazy. Yeah. Okay. And the film is set in New Orleans just after Hurricane Katrina. Did you actually shoot on location in the Lower Ninth Ward? Yes, we shot on location. Mm-hmm. Um, that was, The Lower Ninth Ward became our back lot. It was a privilege to work with the beautiful people there. You know, mm-hmm. the Hurricane Katrina effect is still there uh, as mm-hmm. far as the property is concerned but the people have fully recovered and their spirits are high and hospitality is great and great food and New Orleans is uh, a beautiful city. And yeah, I heard that you were interviewing local people. What did you talk to them about and what did you learn about Katrina that ended up in the film or kind of influencing your directing? Well, you know, it's, it's, it's all these different points of views, right? Some points of views are conspiratorial. Mm. Some are biblical in context um and some are just straight up coincidental nature and i, I was interested in mm-hmm. all those points of views and if you watch the film you'll see that i kind of included their way of thinking that's why you see terence howard plays a character called the saint who's represents spirituality but yet there's corruption in the spirituality ethan hawk plays the councilman mm-hmm. who may know that know that the conspiracy is real, but he but there's corruption in in, in politics and that corruption benefits him. You mm-hmm. know? Rob Morgan is just a hustler. He's just hustling. He's a cop, but he's hustling the people. He don't care. He's more like, yo, that's that's life. That's nature. It's just what it is. And an underlying theme of the film is the way that the US government abandoned black America during Katrina. How does it feel knowing that that's just as pertinent today as it was 15 years ago? I mean, it's tragedy. It's tragic to know that. Mm -hmm. It's even more tragic to know that it's the same thing 50 years ago. I'm more of a spiritual guy than a political guy. So I would just say this in a spiritual way and I'm a pragmatic man. Look, Mm -hmm. I'm going to make a joke out of it. So Arnold Schwarzenegger ends up marrying or having a baby with his maid. Mm -hmm. Right? And end up, you know, she has a good life now. Mm-hmm. Point being made, right? That's to me, that's funny, right? But no, it ain't funny because all the time of her being in that house mm. and, and adding service to that family, 
led to something different for her. Mm-hmm. Now, for his wife and everything, it's a problem. We understand that. But all the work and energy and service that uh, the black population have given America, you know, not just from slavery, because people, you know, but even from all our children that went to war, you know, a lot of my family, my family works for public service. My, 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 my sister works for, for the city and she helps people find homes and she does it 14 hours a day. My brother uh, works in law enforcement and he does it 16 hours a day. Mm-hmm. And we're basically, we give our service to the country and we pay our taxes. And so we should just pragmatically, logically be afforded the same benefits that any other citizen mm-hmm. is afforded. Because if you pay for, look, if you pay for a movie ticket, you get to come inside and watch the movie. Now you may not get to be at the front row, right? Mm-hmm. That's based on time, but you get to watch the movie. That's for true. us, it's like we pay for the ticket, but we got to stand outside and just hear the sound. Do you feel hopeful about the upcoming election? It's not far off now. I'm, 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 I'm bedazzled. Okay. <laughs> like the thing or bad thing? Actually, look, it's, it's, it's going to be a good thing. I'm, mm-hmm. I'm very optimistic. Okay. I think that, you know, that, you know, this beautiful country is evolving. And I just, it's always been evolving. But the pace of it has been inching. And I think now we need to, instead of taking baby steps, we need to take some leaps. And I think it's time for us to take some leaps. Uh, Kanye West attempted to run for president. Would you ever run for president? Can you see yourself giving it a go? I think you'd be a good president. <laughs> well, for now, I'm president of the Wu-Tang Productions. <laughs> First step. And now, Jim Jarmusch, who you worked with before on Ghost Star, Coffee and Cigarettes, Dead Don't Die, he also once did a New Orleans film, Down by Law. Did you watch that as preparation for shooting Cutthroat City? Um, I've, I've seen Down by Law many times already. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm a big fan of Tom Waits as well. I, yeah, Jim, there's a couple of shots in my film that's a homage to Jim. Jim is one of my uh, inspirations and you know, when he, I mean, he started my really my whole Hollywood career. And if you really look at it, he's mm-hmm. the first one that came to me and gave me a chance to score his movie Ghost Dog. And he actually put me, you know, a small scene in the film. And that was like, like I got bit right there, you know what I mean? <laughs> and it slowly turned me into, into becoming this. Um, so, yeah, so uh, Jim, good friend of mine and love his work. And definitely there's at least two setups in my film that's like, my version of a Jim Jarmusch shot. Okay. And there's also a number of references to The Wizard of Oz in the movie as well. Were they already in the script or was that you? Is that an old favorite of yours, The Wizard of Oz? Oh, The Wizard of Oz is a masterpiece, classic, you know. Some of the idea, it was in the script, but some of the idea was also brought by discussing uh, the script with the actor. So T.I. Uh, was very, very engaged in this film. I mean, I'm, I, I was... Personally, I was very impressed with his performance and his choice. Um, when he started calling each one of those guys a character from mm-hmm. The Wizard of Oz, that wasn't written. Uh, okay, yeah. He, 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 he caught it in his own mind mm-hmm. that, okay, if his place is Oz, because I said, yo, it's like you, 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 like your shit is Oz. And he was able to take that idea and even build upon it. I think being a lyricist and being a poet in his own right it became, it was a natural thing. But when we got that take from him, I was like, I'm keeping that. I got to keep that. That makes it in my film. And the film was supposed to premiere at South by Southwest. Were you frustrated about that not happening? Or do we all just have to accept that big events like that aren't going to happen for a very long time? Oh, no, of course I was frustrated. You know, when you make a film, you know, you become a family and, and then you all walk away from each other. And that family gets to come back for a Thanksgiving dinner which is the premiere. Okay. And when it doesn't happen, it's, uh, you know, it's something, if, it, it's, it's, I mean, look, personally and professionally, yes, I'm frustrated. But on the reality of life, no, it, it's, it, you know, we're going through a pandemic mm-hmm. and the world has a lot of uh, equations to figure out. And, uh, you know, I, I definitely push, you know, give my condolences and, 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 and my, my prayers to all these families around the world we're losing to the unseen, 
you know, an unseen uh, killer. Let's just call it right. And um, when it when it, when they when they said that it was a problem here in America, and we had to you know shut the shut the country down and sit still. You no, know, I sat still. So mm-hmm. no matter how much frustration or how much personal loss it felt like professionally, so I'm not, excuse me for saying personal, I mean professional loss. Mm. Um, personally, I, you know, I, I, I sat still with my family and, and uh, just, just followed, followed the rules and put the mask on and just do what we had to do to hopefully help bend the curve, as they say. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but it was definitely un, un, unexpected. Somebody made a joke. Like I said, a joke with you. Somebody said to me, mm-hmm. they said, well, man with the iron fist came out and Hurricane Sandy struck New York. <laughs> <laughs> uh, now you have this other film out in the pandemic. Which, what, 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 could your next, what could your next film possibly bring? I said, well, we did all the, we did all the, uh, the bad things. I think maybe my next film would be the spark of world peace. <laughs> <laughs> Fingers crossed. And yeah. in the UK, one of our biggest cinema change to, chains has just announced that it's going to close its doors for the foreseeable future. What do you think wow. the fate of cinema is? Do you think cinema will survive this or will we all just be watching films at home for the rest of time? Wow. I'm rooting for survival. Mm-hmm. You know, I think the communal experience of watching a film in a theater um, most people look. You could put up some some setups at home, but it's nothing like watching a film mm. in a big theater with all the speakers, the the popcorn, yeah. the 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 and and the communal experience of everybody sharing and uh, everybody quiet but still sharing emotions. Mm. To me, that is powerful. And I look. I don't know what we're gonna do, but I would pray that we don't throw that away. Can you tell me a little bit about the 36 Cinema platform? Is that your attempt to support the independent movie industry right now? Yeah, so 36 Cinema is uh, trying to create the communal experience um, at home, right? Mm-hmm. Whereas on most streaming services, you know, if you watch a movie now, you don't know who's watching it with you. But on 36 Cinema, it's like a theater. You go to that virtual theater yeah. and the, the, the movie will start at 9 o'clock and you know we had a movie called uh, Shogun Assassin, and we had five thousand people watching it at the same time. Yeah. It's actually the biggest theater in the world when you look at it at that capacity. There's never been <laughs> five thousand seats at one time watching the, watching a yeah. uh, a movie. And mm-hmm. in the independent theaters, you know they got a chance to sell tickets and take profit from that. And for some of them, you know, it was it was the only economics they had during the quarantine. Mm-hmm. And so I'm a big supporter of cinema. I love film. Film saved my life. I think it has the power to save and inspire mi- people of all ages and walks. And I'm going to, I'll do whatever I can to support it. And 36 cin- Cinema is, is one of my attempts. What films are coming up next? Or what kinds of films are coming up next? On oh, 36 Cinema? Yeah. Oh, well it's, well, it's October. So we're trying to put together a double creature feature <laughs> <laughs> and so um so we're working with uh with janice janice is a uh you know uh film distributor mm-hmm. and they got some great titles and uh we got a couple of 35 millimeter prints um from an independent theater uh some some unique titles and we're thinking of uh i'm thinking night of the living dead right I Remember the, yeah yeah, I, yeah. <laughs> see one thing i try to do as in, the, in the beginning phase, I want to say, I want people to watch films that inspire me, right? And inspire art. So mm-hmm. George Romero, he inspired a genre of art with Night, Night of the Living Dead. I showed the audience um, uh, Shaolin versus Wu-Tang because that was the film that actually gave me the name to my band. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And it inspired me. So I'm hoping that when other kids or other people see it, they could get a bit of inf- uh, inspiration. And one thing we do at 36 Cinema, I'll say this last thing, I want to talk, talk to all the interview on it, but we also have live commentary, right? Okay. Uh, with professionals and people within the industry. We, you know, we had the director from Man From Hong Kong and we chose that film because that was one of Tarantino's favorite action films of that genre. He had t- he turned me on to the film. Hmm. And so I reached out to the, that director and said, would you come on and talk? 
to the public about your film. It was the first Western uh, Asian connection in films before Into the Dragon. Mm -hmm. You see what I mean? And yeah. I, just, I just love when people who, who love movies get to learn more information and see films they wouldn't normally see and hear some backstory and commentary on those films. Fantastic. And uh, let's talk a little bit about Wu-Tang and American Saga. What was it like watching someone play you on screen? Yeah. Well, how can I say that? You know what? My wife said that mm -hmm. he did a good job because he kept <laughs> doing all these little nuances and <laughs> all these little <laughs> clinks that I got. He's yeah. all hunched over. I thought I, I thought I fixed myself, but that <laughs> 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 no, was fun. It's been renewed for a second season. What's happening with that, considering COVID? How much had been done pre-COVID, and is there stuff happening right now? What's going on with it? Yeah, so we, so you know, our renewal came uh, in January, which was a little late renewal, um, hmm. but it, but it was a big uh, merger happening with the companies. I, I don't know if you know about, um, you know, I think Disney and Fox and all these guys okay. was doing. And then, so they had to really decide what shows will still mm. be in the equation. And, and we were chosen to continue, which is great for us. And so the process was, okay, let's open our writer's room and get started. And we mm -hmm. thought we would have to write and film at the same time, basically chase the dragon. Mm -hmm. But we, COVID actually gave us the small advantage of having all of our scripts written. So we have our whole season prepared. And... Mm -hmm. um. And so once we go into production, it'll be a, a, a easy, a fast moving train. And, and what story does season two tell? Oh, you're going to have to watch it right there. <laughs> <laughs> and in terms of your own music, it was recently revealed that you've sold 50% of your songwriting and production credits in a new deal. Why did you do that? And is it marking a new chapter in your musical career? What I did, so I, I have the, I, look, I've been privileged with having two creative outlets. One, me as an artist and a producer, songwriter, you know, of my own work. And then also one as a producer, songwriter of Wu-Tang Clan's work. Mm -hmm. um, and my, my self catalog is, is much heavier than my Wu-Tang catalog, which is interesting, mm -hmm. right? But, but I look to have um, a partnership, you know, by by doing by by putting half of this of this catalog into another company's hand, right? Mm -hmm. That I'm trusting that they're going to increase the value of the half that I kept. Okay. And and they're also thinking I'm going to increase the value of the half that they have uh, obtained. And by doing that, it's sort of like it's a, mm -hmm. it's a it was a smart business decision in the sense of let's say it's, it's worth a dollar today, right? And in 10 years, we make it worth $3. So my profit becomes what was worth a dollar is now worth a dollar fifty. So I gained. And then they also gained their dollar fifty. And I yeah. also got the immediate uh chance to play with some economics now. And the last Wu Tang album was 2017, The Saga Continues. Is there another one on the cards? Have you been chatting during lockdown with the other guys about a new record? Uh, mm, uh <laughs> I, I would say this. No, I would say that you know, such a such a big group of artists, Wu Tang Clan, and somebody's always creating something. You know, right mm -hmm. now I'm enjoying Method Man on the Power TV show. Uh, Inspector Deck has his his Zar Face record that's in circulation, and so it's just always some product out there. And for us to all come back together and record something for the world, that's unpredictable. But I'm always rooting for it. So if if you know if if the bad signal goes up, or if I gotta even turn the bad signal up myself, mm -hmm. bong bong, I'm ready. And in terms of your production work, last year you had a credit on a Miley Cyrus track. That seemed like a bit of an unusual team up. What was it like working with her? Was that just her sampling cream? Oh uh, no, it was um some other producers was working on it. And they and they had the song and, and they felt that um it'll be a great collaboration and so they reached out to me, uh, mm -hmm. gave me a chance to add some flavor to the song and build it up, you know, add some cool flavor to it. And I was actually in Holland 
when I got the call and I, and Ghostface was with me. Mm-hmm. And so I was like, yo, Ghost, what's up? You like Miley Cyrus? He's like, I love her. <laughs> I said, okay. Uh, they, you know, they're thinking that they think they want me to kind of add, add on to this song that they're creating. It's called Dreams. He was like, um, he let me hear And I played it. He was like, yeah, do that, man. Do that. <laughs> you know what I mean? And so I done it. And are you and Paul Banks of Interpol working on anything together? It's been four years since your Banks and Steels album came out. Is there going to be a follow up? Well, one thing, well, that's something that happened during the quarantine. Me and Paul been sending each other tracks. He, he, he sent, we, we got a song that we just finished uh, right before the, um, this campaign, movie campaign came out called The Pains of Love. And I think, uh, <laughs> I think uh, in COVID, The Pains of Love, like the song is funny because it's like the pains of love is something that we're willing to endure, you know? Yeah. And that's people who are locked up in each other and can't go out for months. Can you endure that pain? The, the joy of love, but how about the pain of love? And in terms of other upcoming projects, next year the new Minions film is released and you're one of the voice actors. What can you tell us about that experience and what role do you play? Are you a Minion? Wow, you got a lot of information there. <laughs> <laughs> do my research. Um, Wow, look, um, no, I, I'm not a minion. I'm a, I'm a character that comes in, you know, on this journey that, that these guys are going through. V- very fun, very funny. Uh, such a privilege and honor to be part of the film. Uh, you know, I just remember my son, uh, when the first Despicable for me came out, just, you know, just remember him like being a big fan of it and the toy being in the house. You know what I mean, and and uh, for me to get a chance to be a part of that, and 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 for him one day to look at it and go, oh, hey, it's my dad's voice. That's that's kind of like some things we do, some things we get lucky with, shall I say? So for me, I feel like it was lucky for for um for for you know the Universal team and the producers of Minions to reach out to me and to have me uh, lend my talent to it. So it's it's it's, it's kind of like a, I don't know, it's just a joyful lucky happy thing for me and i just and it's fun i, I the, the the composer of the film he uh he brought me in to help do a couple of scenes as well it's so much fun y'all amazing and that is all my questions done thank you so much for your time and have a great day well thank you Peace. <laughs> Cheers. bye